Um, Minister, first of all, could you give us your sense of what is going on at the moment? There is plainly already a lot of trade between our two countries. There is a huge demand for it to be increased in the future. What is the state of play? You know, uh, it's my pleasure to join this conference. You know what? I've got a diesel car. <laughs> is it demonized? <laughs> <laughs> I get <being> confused. <laughs> Well, uh, p perhaps I divided my, divide my remarks in two parts. Uh, first, I, a few comments on the China-UK relations in general, and uh, economic and trade relations between our two countries in particular, with some reference to the automobile industry, uh, cooperation, I mean, that field. First of all, in the general picture of UK-China relations, we are in the best of times. So the key word we use is golden era of the bilateral relations. You know, the relations between China and UK has gone from strength to strength. In 2015, Chinese President, President Xi, visited the UK in a state visit, which upgraded our relations to a strategic, uh, comprehensive strategic partnership, to a global strategic comprehensive partnership for the 21st century. We say that opened up the golden era of relations between our two countries. And of course, uh, you had a change of premiership following the Brexit uh, referendum, but a pretty smooth transition was achieved when Prime Minister May became the, Theresa May became the Prime Minister. And early this year, she paid an official visit to China. We say her visit opened up a new chapter in our bilateral relations, where both leaders of our two countries agreed to make a more strategic, uh, pragmatic, global, and inclusive relations between our two countries. Uh, by strategic, we mean we should always approach our relations in the longer term, in strategic terms. Pragmat pragmatic, I will talk about that in the second part of my, my, my uh, uh, opening remarks. And by being global means that China and the UK are global players. So we need to set our sights on meeting the global challenges together by cooperating in many multilateral uh, institutions like the UN. Like, like, the G, G, like uh, the G20. Inclusive means that we need to respect the differences and draw on each other's strengths so as to promote uh, trust and understanding and also encourage mutual learning among, civil, among, civilized, among, civiliz among civilizations. So I, I very much hope that the relation will continue to prosper. Uh, about economic and trade relations, we say that we are enjoying many golden fruits in terms of economic and trade cooperation. I also know that uh, we always say China's development is an opportunity for UK. Likewise, UK's prosperity also is, also good, uh, is, also good is also good to China. In terms of, uh, in terms of trade, uh, UK, China is UK's fastest growing export market. Actually, last year, UK export to China grew by 20%. In, in, in the meantime, your automobiles uh, export to China, road uh, vehicles is also about 20%. Since 2010, UK export to China has grown by 60%. So China is UK's fastest growing export uh, market. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, two-way investment, of course, Chinese investment continue to flow into the UK uh, after, after, after Brexit. Uh, now that uh, despite uh, the total D FDI from China to UK is smaller than that of UK's FDI to China, but the investment has been growing uh, pretty fast. This, of course, has helped job creation, economic prosperity, and green development here. As we enter the 40th year of China's reform in opening up, the Chinese leaders and Chinese government is determined to further open the doors of China. So pregnancy in Bo Forum announced that China is going to provide better market access to the Chinese market. We should better protect the, I, I, uh, the IPR. We'll create better business environment for foreign businesses, for foreign business in China. And China is ready to buy more from the overseas markets. So he announced a host of measures uh, to do that. Mind you that in November, we will be having the first international import exposition in Shanghai. So the businesses are welcome to join the exhibition there in November. Mm. In terms of automobile industry, of course, we all know that you are very proud that the UK has a long history of auto industry and you have many quintessential uh, brands, heritage brands in the UK. China's advantage is that uh, we are the largest uh, car markets. Last year, we produced 29 million 
cars, almost sold 20 million cars, and imported 1.2 million, million cars. And the Chinese people are crazy about cars. And uh, you know nowadays, uh, not only in the cities, the cities, p residents want to upgrade their cars. Yeah. And uh, maybe one, Mac, Mac, not necessarily one that uh, produced by Mac, McLaren. Uh, <laughs> but in the rural areas, many people are saving up to buy their first cars. So there are many opportunities for joint collaboration between China and the UK. Already that uh, Chinese car makers acquired MG Rover 2005, and the Geely Group, uh, uh, Geely, uh, Geely Group acquired the London Taxi Company in, 20, uh, in 2013. And uh, some of your brands are already investing in China, like uh, Aston Martin, and even Jaguar, Jaguar Land Rover are investing in China. So I see good prospect for auto cooperation between our two countries. Right, okay, well hold that thought because we will get back to it and as I say, I'll throw it open to you as well. Uh, Your Excellency, the same question really, the, 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 the sense of the current position and the sense as well of what that position, how that position might change post Brexit. Well, first of all, I, uh, I would like to look at this uh, globally. Uh, we have had uh, the past uh, seven decades or more uh, very successful global economy growth, as uh, uh, Chris has shown us uh, the past uh, 20 years or so. Uh, the world economy has been doing very well, uh, with the exception of just a few scratches. Now, why has this been possible? Because it's been, it's been rule-based, and it's been multilateral, and everybody respected rules. And this is how the economy continued to grow. So on the macroeconomic figures, we have very successful statistics. Uh, there's no country that is poorer than uh, it was uh, even uh, 20 years ago. So uh, as an aggregate figure, everybody's doing better. But globalization's been criticized as not be giving the benefit to everyone alike uh, in your country, and therefore, the problem is not really international. It comes from the domestic constituencies, resentment, uh, 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 distrust of the system, because they don't believe uh, when they see the rosy picture that they are benefiting from it. But that is not a reason for us to move away from the rule-based order, because if we have no rules, there's no predictability. The uncertainty we talk about Brexit, being a danger is because the same will happen if we have no rules. If uh, predictability is gone, how would you put your money into the future? Because you don't know what will happen. And therefore, first of all, I think we need to go back, really, to the rule-based international order. And this is not just economy. It is also affecting the security, the political, strategic relationship. We have to be rule-based. This is the first thing I really would like to say, although this may not be uh, a government uh, conference, I think it is, applies the same to all people alike. Especially the weaker countries, what could they depend on other than rules? There's no might that uh, will allow them to be brutal or to have their views uh, imposed on others. They have to respect rules, and the expectation has to be mutual. That's why I think we are entering a very uh, important stage in global, not just economy, but global politics and global economy. Now, one of these uh, resentments against uh, uh, non ha not having a fair share of the benefit that you read in the press, uh, you always uh, hear the rosy picture, uh, of course, the driving force for political and emotional entanglement that we see. Uh, Brexit might have been uh, one result of that. Uh, we see the US, uh, the so-called Rust Belt, not being uh, happy about what they see. But Detroit uh, has been in difficulty for a number of years. I was there 30 years ago. And uh, you could see uh, windows with uh, uh, panels uh, of the woods uh, closing them in. Uh, it has therefore been uh, a difficult uh, time for moving away from what you do now to the future. Now, 
the Japanese uh, economy is doing fairly well. Uh, we hope we'll do even better. But in, in terms of auto trade that uh, you're interested here, you may know very well that Japan eliminated tariffs on auto in 1978. Now we have agreed with EU on a economic uh, <coughs> uh, strategic partnership, uh, we call EPA, uh, which we hope will become effective uh, uh, early next year so that the UK will still be EU member when uh, the Japan EU EPA will become effective and therefore be applicable to EU, hopefully also during the transition time. Of course, there are many ifs and uh, conditions that need to be satisfied in order to, for that to happen, but this is uh, a major achievement. Uh, Japan has been looking for a economic uh, package uh, with the EU which allows the two countries to trade uh, very liberally. It has taken many, many years. Why? Because, as you may know, on industrial products, Japan has almost no tariff. So we can't have anything on the table to trade with the EU, mm -hmm. which has high tariffs, including cars, you know, it's 10%. Japan, zero from 1978. Now, we've agreed last year uh, with the uh, Europeans that uh, uh, the EU tariffs on NOTO will be reduced and eliminated to zero. When? Eight years after the agreement enters into force. You have 10% of a lot of staging you can do. Zero is zero. And that is the, the approach of having tariffs used as a trading chip. I think uh, it's not uh, fair to say those who are now trying to bring tariffs as a weapon, uh, if you have been doing that, how can you be critical of others? And this is the problem that we see. Uh, the mutuality of interest should lead us into creating a world that uses the private sector's ingenuity, creativity, and also allowing the most effective appropriation allocation of resources. And I mean, I'm meaning the most effective global supply chain. Because the 70 years that had been successful has been made possible by bringing all resources most effectively, and it was not government doing. It was the private companies doing. One major benefit, and this is my last point, mm. that uh, these free, free, free trading system uh, give benefit to is the small and medium-sized firms. Major companies been doing, doing these global businesses for centuries, and they know things, they can adapt, uh, they could uh, write papers if uh, that's necessary, but SMEs can only do within uh, their limits and they have no capacity to be overburdened by administrative procedures or uncertainties. And of course, uh, they will survive within, in an extreme case, the village, town, city, or in their own community. But by bringing the uh, creativity and the uh, talent of the SMEs have been one of the sources for this allocation of the most talented, most effective use of available resources. And therefore, having a rule-based system that allows everyone to be on board and active and be trading commercially with each other with no fear that uh, you'll be cheated or deceived is really the basis. And that's why I had to say in the outset that rule-based is the basis from which we need to discuss. Mm, very interesting. Can I pick you up on one point? The point that you made about zero tariffs eventually with the EU under the terms of the agreement. What does that then mean for the value of Britain as a base, particularly in the car industry, for inward investment? Now, uh, WTO is not making a lot of progress, and I don't think that's a secret, uh, which I believe is very unfortunate because when we're talking about these uh, bilateral or plurilateral 
uh, trade deals, we need to bring in the notion of rule of origin. In WTO, there's no rule of origin because what you agree will be applied to everyone alike as long as countries are member of WTO. So you don't have to differentiate a product coming from Britain or Japan or China, it doesn't matter. But when you have a trade deal signed bilaterally, you have to limit the application of that treaty treatment to products that originates from the signatory of that treaty. Therefore, you have to distinguish where that product comes from, not just uh, being transported out uh, from uh, the, 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 uh, the, the place of uh, departure, but make sure that it, it really is made in Japan or made in Britain. Now, EU has a very high insistence on this rule of origin, uh, sometimes uh, uh, fairly high, and therefore uh, the uh, elimination of tariffs, of course, is one thing, but it also has to be applic applicable to the existing global supply chain for the actual trade to benefit from the elimination of uh, the tariffs. We believe it will be quite difficult uh, as uh, the elimination of the tariff goes on if the rule of origin is maintained at a very high threshold which is not reflecting the current uh, business arrangement. The EU uh, uh, input into uh, the auto industry here in UK, you already know, uh, in terms of parts is about 60% uh, or plus. Now, there are about 10% less a bit uh, parts coming from Japan for the Japanese branded cars manufactured in UK. And those uh, parts will have tariff elimination and 10% parts uh, is a significant part and it will benefit the Japanese manufacturers here uh, to have a cheaper uh, part supplied to make them in UK. But if there is a rule of origin that uh, uh, requires that not to be shipped from Japan alone, because the Japanese parts are also procured from Thailand, from Korea, from China, and the assembly may be in Japan, uh, but if you apply a rule of origin that is very stringent, then that part may not benefit from the preferential tariff elimination. So it's a complicated thing. We do have these schemes that uh, we are going to uh, enforce, uh, and hopefully if we, first of all, uh, have the Japan EU EPA come into effect, a future step will be to have a much more ambitious Japan UK trade deal. Yeah, and on that subject, again, it's almost the same question with China. How ambitious can that future uh, UK China relationship be, and specifically with the car industry in mind? In other words, are we, we, could we envisage? Chinese factories being set up here? What, 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 how do you see the relationship? Yes, uh, of course, uh, I've said that uh, uh, the Chinese auto industry and the UK auto industry enjoy a lot of uh, com complementarity. Certainly, you can learn from each other and help each other. As I mentioned, that uh, the Geely Group purchased, acqui uh, acquired mm. uh, a London, tax London uh, taxi company in 2013. Actually, last year, we see the launching of a new, uh, new SD plant in Coventry, uh, producing low emission, zero emission taxis for landing. Perhaps some of the black cabs on the landing streets yeah. uh, will be, or, two or one or two, again. some of them will be produced by SD plant. And this is the first ever uh, UK automobile factory, newly built factory plant in in, 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 a, in a decade, and also the first uh, plant that is devoted purely to uh, new energy efficient, energy efficient cars. So this means that uh, Chinese auto automakers have already established plants here, UK, and are using UK as a base. Likewise, I mentioned about the story of uh, MG Rover when 20, uh, 2005, MG Rover went into administration, uh, the Shanghai Automobile, Automobile Industry Corporation and the Nanjing Automobiles acquired MG Rover. So they have been putting investment 
into MG Rover, now rebranded MG Motor. Uh, they have launched the new models, and also they are at, on, on the verge of developing new electric cars. But does that stop or, or go into a higher gear post-Brexit? Given that you also have this relationship with the European Union, of course, and, yeah. and a deal in the offer. I think this, uh, you, you, you cannot um, attend this conference without talking about the Brexit. Huh? <laughs> uh, I think but the Chinese uh, investors and the Japanese investors <laughs> have the same common concern about uh, Brexit and especially access to the single market. Certainly for those companies who are based in the UK, who actually in the past eyed European market for their products, it's a, it's a concern. If there is a tariff, if there is custom, certainly it will add into the cost of the, of the industries. Certainly that's one of the barriers for the car manufacturer uh, industry in this, in this respect. Yeah. But there are, there are some other barriers uh, as well, in terms of uh, before we can promote uh, better and more economic and trade uh, uh, relations, we are ambitious for more economic and trade op cooperation between our two countries. But there are a few things that uh, we think are in the way. For instance, we, we still, uh, we know that uh, European-wide still impose a high-tech export ban uh, to China as a result of the Cold War. So anything that could be used for military purposes, high tech, is banned from exporting to China. Actually, what about some dual use products? Dual use products. I mean, for those products, originally perhaps UK could have exported to China, making a lot of money. But because of this ban, they are not exporting to China. But uh, after a few years, Chinese technology would have gone up. So your advanced uh, products became obs obsolete. Another thing is about this uh, visa system. The Chinese uh, staff and administrators or who are working in the UK need to apply a so-called tier two visa, which gives them a few years time to stay here. And also that, that's preconditioned on the level of their wages, must be very high wages. And this actually is in the way of some long-term uh, long cooperation between uh, some of the important projects. Sometimes you need your people to be here for 10 years rather than five years to think another person. Yeah. Uh, or after five years, you have to raise the level of the wages to your staff. And uh, sometimes this in the way of yeah. expanding well, business between those, two those countries. Those are two very good, interesting points, because they're mm. points where obviously mm. there is room for negotiation mm. and for the mm. two governments to, mm. when people talk about these government mm. deals being done, those mm. are two very interesting things that could be. Let me throw it out uh, to anyone who wants to ask uh, 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 either of our Distinguished panelists, uh, anything. I, I uh, will go to the gentleman there and then um, we'll go back to the world trade system as well in a second. But here we go. Uh, Peter Campbell from the Financial Times. A question for uh, the ambassador. Um, previously, the Japanese government uh, issued a number of concerns it had over Brexit uh, and the automotive industry. Uh, I wonder, given the current state of the Brexit negotiations, if any of those have been met uh, and how certain you are that there will still be Japanese automotive manufacturing in Britain in the decades to come? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, I think you have all uh, read uh, what the Japanese government uh, uh, issued to both, not just the UK, but to EU, as uh, issues that need to be addressed uh, uh, during the Brexit negotiation. That was done in uh, September uh, 2017. This was three, less than three months after the result of the referendum came in because we worked through summer. <laughs> <laughs> you looked at... Uh, that's possibly the most pointed remark that's been made so far. Uh, but that's uh, uh, close to two years ago already. And uh, uh, I don't think... Uh, we really have any outcome that uh, we can compare uh, with uh, the uh, paper that we've submitted. So we are waiting. In the meantime, uh, of course, there are two things. First, uh, in any negotiation, uh, the team, your team, has to get together and have uh, a uniform view on what you need to do and how you conduct negotiations. And it takes time. Uh, I, I've been in many negotiations, and I know that very well, because there are conflicting interests, and uh, 
the uh, EU departure is really the negotiation of not just one century, but centuries. It is a very difficult negotiation because it involves so many things, which uh, you all know, and that's not going to be uh, done uh, overnight. Therefore, uh, it is uh, no criticism to anyone that uh, this will require a lot more time and a lot more coordination. The different interest groups, uh, they also have to be uh, on board. And because once uh, you agree and you need to implement it, you don't want to have any obstruction in the implementing stage. So it, it is an, an issue that takes a lot of time. That's why uh, we thought that uh, for uh, issues to be uh, identified at the very outset, uh, we wanted to contribute to have a very structured and constructive negotiation. That's why we produced that paper. Uh, that paper is not government paper per se, because it was more a collective uh, view of the Japanese. Uh, private sector industry, we have more than 1,000 companies operating in UK. And there are uh, not uh, as many in Europe, but uh, quite a bit. Uh, because Japanese investment uh, in U European Union, we have about more than 40% concentrated in UK. So 27 has to, to divide the remaining uh, 60 or so, but 40 is in UK. And that's, uh, that shows the importance, and we are the second largest uh, investor to UK after uh, US uh, as a non-EU country. And therefore, oh, we did have a stake in what happens in Brexit, and that's why we did not mind giving up summer holidays and working. <laughs> uh, so I hope, I was hoping that uh, that would be uh, a, 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 an issue uh, and a paper that uh, will be studied very carefully, and I think they have done so uh, recently. So it took a little time. Um, and now I think uh, the people are very well aware of the issues. Uh, of course, uh, FT and uh, economists and the others knew it, but uh, I think this has become more of a public knowledge. And the industries also, and the SMEs that I mentioned, they also need to be aware of what's at stake. And I think this is now sinking in. So we are uh, having a good conversation, by the way. The Japanese industry leaders, 18 of them, were invited to Downing 10 uh, about a couple of months ago. And we had more than one and a half hour with the prime minister, together with three secretaries in charge. And that is unusual for private sector persons to be able to have one and a half hour of prime minister's time. It, uh, no, not that uh, uh, I haven't done it, but uh, uh, it will be very rare, even in Japan, to do it with the Japanese companies. Mm -hmm. uh, here, uh, the Prime Minister was open and uh, invited uh, the Japanese industry leaders to come and discuss these things in detail. And because the private sector has concrete businesses and concrete issues they are raising, that was an opportunity for each and every company different. Auto was there too. But there was electronics, there were other uh, financial services. They raised concrete issues directly to the prime minister. And this is the spirit that I think uh, will help move the process forward and ensure achieving a constructive result. This is still a process in moving. And I think we need to be cooperative and do collaboration. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I throw it open again to anyone who wants to ask uh, either of our guests. And think, gentlemen, there again. Yeah. Oh, and lady over there. Yep. I'll go to someone who hasn't asked a question before first and then come back to you. Yeah, here we go. Sorry to be a complete bore. Lisa O'Carroll from The Guardian. I'm going to ask um, His, Excellency, His Excellency about the car industry, the Japanese car industry. Can you be specific about what you think the future is for Nissan and for Honda and the, the other Japanese companies here? Um, and is there a deadline by which time they will need to um, make an investment decision? We've heard from BMW that they need decisions by the end of August. Is that the same for the Japanese companies, or do you have more time? What's the end of August? So the end of August is what BMW said. They oh. needed the decision to be made specifically, actually, on, I think, the transition deal as much as on anything, but they wanted to have really hard and fast things by the end of August, or else they were going to have to... Uh, re reduce investment and make decisions along those lines. Is it the same for those Japanese companies? Uh, I uh, am not running Nissan or Honda. Uh, in Japan, government doesn't run companies. 
So uh, uh, my if I direct answer to you, in all honesty, is that I don't know. But I am, of course, in constant contact with all of them. I've been to uh, all of the factories, uh, Sunderland included. Uh, what I find by, through these visits, and this is not just meeting with, uh, uh, most of the companies are no longer run by Japanese. Uh, they have uh, British executives or uh, other European uh, uh, executives running it. And the workers are, of course, um, largely British, but also EU and others. And I've been talking to them, and one thing I am very encouraged, that they like it here. They enjoy working here, because the working environment is very uh, suitable to do business. Uh, the legal framework is there, the industrial relations is um, uh, manageable, the supply chain is there, the quality of uh, uh, work is fine, the work ethics is something they enjoy. Therefore, they, have, they are not thinking of uh, leaving or uh, deserting something that they've been working for 40 years plus. And they have a community relationship that uh, they cherish very much. And the local community welcomed them. So why do you leave? It's a very excellent way, uh, place to do business. Now, yes, this be, there will be difficulty, and they are envisaging possibility of having difficulty. No manufacturing firm that I know, uh, it's not limited to Japan, a Japanese industry, uh, I think has really expanded the uh, capacity since Brexit uh, referendum because uh, the uncertainty is there. Uh, they cannot e expect that there will be more car sales going to Europe and already about uh, 80 or 90, sometimes even higher percentage of their production is going to the EU market if there is tariff, if there are procedures, uh, that certainly will be in jeopardy. Uh, but uh, they have not uh, reduced or cut down or uh, eliminated any of the lines. The diesel issue, you know very well, uh, is affecting them, but it's not Brexit directly. What is more important today, and I think uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Chris uh, Grayling, will uh, hopefully speak about this subject, is the future. And that's high tech. And it's mobility, connectivity, and how you bring not just the auto companies, but the ITs, the communications, the software, bringing them together so that the transportation will really become a public utility that will be made available to everyone. I'm referring to the need of having a much more enhanced research and development cooperation. And UK is the best basis. And they already are doing it. You've seen it, uh, Nissan doing uh, an experiment of uh, driverless cars running on public roads. Where else could you do that? Uh, and even in Japan, it will be very difficult. You could do it in your garage, but that doesn't take you too far. <laughs> but here, with the, re the, the regulatory framework, it's possible. So this is a scheme that I think uh, will bring future into your hands. Ambassador, thank you. Let me th um, throw, we've got limited time before lunch. Gentleman down here, if I could get the microphone down to him. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask the ambassador Two quick questions. Would it be a very bad thing if the UK brexited and traded under WTO regulations? And the second one is, I did have a quick look at the Japanese EU trade agreement. As you say, it seems quite liberal. Would it be possible for Britain to say, we would like something very similar to this if we brexited fully? Yeah. Actually, before the ambassador answers that, can I put that to both of you, Minister, because that seems to me a, a, a relevant question from the perspective of China. So if there was a, a, what people call a hard Brexit, we just went to WTO rules, what does that do to, to, to trade between China and Britain? Uh, China, of course, always supports a rule-based international trading system. And China has been working very hard, actually, to reach... Uh, free trade agreements with many countries, uh, either on a bilateral basis or on a regional basis or, or on a wide regional basis, like uh, free trade agreements in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. 
certainly uh, Brexit will open up many prospects for further economic trade cooperation. When Prime Minister May visited China, both China and the UK announced they are, going, they are launching an economic and trade review so that to identify prior priorities in our bilateral and the trading relations. Yeah. And I'm, well, I, mean, I suppose I'm, I'm, my, my wonder is whether yeah. that, that review and those things are speeded up in, in, in those circumstances yeah, I, where Britain I, is needing to do deals outside. Yeah, I understand that that's a sort of preparation for a possible free trade agreement, but we don't know yet whether you are going to uh, have the uh, power to sign free trade agreement or, or whether you are leaving you, no. you But if not. we did, if we did, in those circumstances, then you did, we there is always preparation. welcome yeah. prospects for yeah. better economic and trade cooperation, certainly between yeah. China and UK, and there is large potential for that. Yeah. Ambassador. Well, if you go to uh, uh, WTO, uh, it's of course better than having no rule at all. Uh, but uh, the reason there have been so many preferential arrangements among small number of countries is because uh, the WTO is not moving. And the universal liberalization has stopped at uh, uh, the WTO uh, adoption conference uh, in Marrakesh, uh, which was the end of the Uruguay round. The next round, we start forgetting what was called already, and it's been there for decades and no progress. So it was inevitable for the world to move on to have different schemes. There are two reasons. One, because there are WTO rules that don't apply to the new issues. Uh, most typically, for example, e-commerce. How do you have a data uh, transmission agreed under a rule? That's one, so the new issues. Uh, because WTO is not more than 20 years old, uh, many progresses have been made in between. And therefore, when you are conducting a very uh, a extensive economic relations cross-border, you want to address those so that the private sector will be confident that the newest, the latest uh, uh, way of doing businesses will also be addressed. That's one. The second is the growing uh, global trade and the supply chain. You learn to have an assurance that you can trade very securely and effectively cross-border and uh, not to worry about tariffs or non-tariff barriers. And the third point, which is the most important in a way, is to have a system on which you can rely for a fair dispute settlement. <laughs> now, if you are not confident that your investment will be treated fairly, and if there's a problem, you can raise it. Who would bring uh, your own money to uh, invest? That's why in TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which I was the chief negotiator for Japan, was uh, a very important scheme we put in, which are not in WTO. Uh, let me start from the end. ISDS, Industry State Dispute Settlement Process, much more rapidly resolved than WTO. Now, there are countries that are saying, okay, we'll bring uh, that issue to WTO. It will take years, because that's a WTO system, a shortcoming. And the bilateral or the other free trade agreement will do like this, um, uh, weeks or months at most, uh, no years. We are not prepared to do that. That's one improvement of this uh, bilateral or plurilateral free trade agreement. The other ones, intellectual property protection. This is key to all businesses today. And uh, the WTO rules, there is, but it's not totally effective or very um, uh, contemporary uh, meeting the uh, demand of the time. So we've improved that too. Now, and then uh, lastly, we have uh, uh, many companies that are privately owned and state owned, competing on equal ground. Now. When you are state-owned, there has to be a discipline that the private sector expects, because the private sectors are responsible for the investors or the stockholders, whereas the state-owned ones are responsible to the state. And there is different motivation. And therefore, in TPP, we have a discipline that the state-owned enterprises will have to abide by. And that's, these are the new norms that need to be taken into account because economy is a living animal and 
we can't just rely on rules that were made 20 years ago. And that's why this is needed. And uh, going to WTO or it doesn't necessarily mean just the issue of tariff. A tariff is important. I don't, I don't uh, uh, minimize that. But many other things uh, are also important. It's a complicated business, isn't it? But it's been fascinating to hear from both of you. Uh, and thank you so much, both of you, for coming in and, and giving up your time. A round of applause, please, for both our foreign <laughs>